Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the Artist Outlook put on by the Appleton Museum of Art, College of Central Florida. I'm Patricia Tomlinson. I'm the curator at the Appleton, and we are thrilled to have the very talented Kristen Hertzog this evening. She is a fabulous artist. She's currently on view, and you'll be seeing some of her artwork very soon. But I wanted her to just briefly introduce herself. Some of you, I know some of you are very good friends of hers, but for those who may not be familiar with Chris, um, I'd like her to please go ahead and just sort of do a brief introduction. Chris? Uh, well, hi, I'm Chris Herzog, and I was born in Massachusetts. I grew up on the seashore right between Boston and the Cape. And um, I've been painting since I was about five from what I can remember. And um, I don't remember it, but I painted the porch floor and we were renting and that work was not well received. <laughs> and so my mother made me scrub it all off. So I got the message early on that art isn't always appreciated. And so um, anyway, then I, grew up and went to college and um, had a fabulous, fabulous art teacher. I, I'm so blessed to have had that teacher, um, Lauren uh, Oliver at Sweetbriar. And um, he really gave me the confidence in my art that I needed. And then I had to take 40 years off and earn a living. <laughs> and so, um, but I always kind of did art along the way and I had a career in graphic design and stuff. So I was always kind of in the field. And um, then I got retired on my 55th birthday and I didn't know I was retired for a couple of years. Um, but eventually I figured it out that, oh, I've been waiting my whole life to paint and maybe I should get started on that. <laughs> you know, so, so, I, so I've been painting ever since pretty much full time. Um, and uh, it's kept me out of a lot of trouble and it's been a wonderful community to be in. So um, I don't know, is that enough or do you want more detail? I taught at the that's, University that's of great. Florida. So, okay. Thank and you. So, so sure. you also taught at the University of Florida, did you not? Yes, yeah, I was there. I was teaching for seven years and I was at the business school for a while as a graphic designer. And, um, and I was teaching publication design, um, which was, a lot of fun but at that point this was in the 90s and computers were still kind of new and the programs were still kind of new so it was difficult because the programs would change about well you know how often they change they're still doing it and um so anyway but i learned a lot and i thought it was good for me to be teaching computers because I wasn't a natural at it. So I understood all the frustrations that my students had because I had been through it. <laughs> and so, um, uh, so it was, it was a good exercise in really learning how to follow the details of what's going on. And um, so, and then, and I was amazed years, because years later I moved to Washington, DC. And um, I was amazed at the number of places I would run into my student, my former students. So that was exciting too. That's cool. So, okay, so let's go back to you discovering you fell in love with painting. Had you been painting previously with your wonderful art professor or did you sort of fall into painting later? No, I was painting, my, my dad used to paint a little bit. He was a civil engineer and um, he used to paint you know, on weekends, and he got me started with my first painting as a kid. And, um, and in high school, we, I painted, I took art and I painted in high school. Um, I guess, yeah, I think I had oil painting in high school, but my teacher, teacher wasn't very good, unfortunately. And the school was very good, but, you know, arts weren't a big deal back then. And so now, now they have the most fabulous art facilities. I'm so jealous of these younger kids. But um, so I, I always liked painting. And then in high school, my parents wanted me to earn money to pay for college. So they put me in my, they put me in my father's friend's engineering offices to learn drafting. And I was the only woman drafts person there for ever. And, um, and I was, it turned out that I was very good at it because 
um, you know, I had the artistic sensibility. And so I would make the drawings look nice. They're just engineering drawings, but when they presented them to the client, they looked nice. So they, I did really well there. And, um, but also it gave me an incredible sensibility with line because you used all different hardness of pencils for different things. And then you used your pitograph pens a lot. So it gave me a lot of facility with pencils and I love drawing. I still love drawing, but, and I've tried, when I got my master's, I went to GW for my master's and um, there I did printmaking, which I loved. And um, over the years, I've just never been in a situation where getting back into a print studio has been easy or possible. And I've, I've ended up, when I, the last 15 years, I've thought about other media, but I realized what I really, really love is just messing around with paint. I just love paint. And, and so also as you get older, you realize, you know, you got to start focusing on things. And so I decided consciously to focus on just painting. And um, I do a little drawing here and there. And I've even in the past won awards for drawing, but um, so far, I haven't explored everything with paint yet, so I'm still working on it. Well, yeah. we're glad you're exploring because it's it's lovely, lovely work. Oh, um, thank you. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about, too, is in your painting, in your painted works, do you are you influenced by a particular individual or style or anything like that? Um, I like a lot of different styles, but I think I've zeroed in mostly on the abstract expressionist period. Uh, I really love Picasso's, which sounds sort of mundane to say, but I I just can't get around it. I really like Picasso's. Um, I love Chagall, I love Clay, Kandinsky. I went through kind of a Kandinsky period. Uh, what else? Um, all the women abstract expressionists. There was a show maybe four or five years ago of women in abstract expressionism. And there's a book out from that show and it was in three different places, Denver, I think. And I went and saw it in Charlotte, North Carolina and then it went to London. And, oh, I just breathed in that show. I just loved it. And the paintings were so big. They were really huge paintings. It was just amazing. So I think that's those are the people I identify with the most. Um, all, all of those women in that group. Um, and there's another book called Ninth Street Women, that's all about um, the women and how much they how they were pretty much ignored while their husbands like Jackson Pollock and uh, you know uh, a lot of the other ones got really famous and the women were there painting right next to them and they were just kind of ignored. <laughs> so. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's that speaks a lot too. I mean, you, you've got the empathy because also you've been a soul woman in a drafts, a drafting. So you mean you've kind of been there. You kind of know, and I think that empathy, you know, is is wonderful and really shines through. So right. why don't we kind of take a peek at your art? Does that sound fun? sure? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, I just want I want to interject that okay. actually I left my last drafting job and decided to get my master's because of sexual harassment. And back then I was too timid. You, you know, you just didn't really confront it. You know? At least that's the way I was raised. And um, I just left the job. It was a very good job. And my boss really, really wanted me to stay. In fact, they kept asking me, are you leaving because of this person? And I kept saying, no, no, no. And I was married at the time and um, and so it, it was just, it's a, it was a factor, big factor back then. And um, it continues to be now. So anyway. Yes, un <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately. Well, yeah. thank you for sharing that. That's, that's really food for thought in talking about careers and talking about possibilities. For right, right. Yeah. Because so many things when I look back could have been different. If, if I had been raised different, but you have to say, well, look, this is the area that I was raised in and these are the cards that I was dealt. So now I'm moving forward. Yeah. Well, we're glad. So let's look at some art. <laughs> okay. 
So let's begin. Um, one of the things that I really love about your artwork is your how you construct your compositions. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, okay. Um, I, I always feel composition is the thing that I struggle with the most. And, um, and this is a painting um, that I was working on over a period of time. I had, I like to work on several paintings at once. Um, when I painted in a group studio, all my group mates would make fun of me because I kept sort of spreading out. And I, cause my ideal number was about seven paintings at the same time. And um, it, it keeps me from doing something dumb on one painting that, you know, being engaged with it and keep on going and going past the point where I'm feeling like I am contributing something. But you just get into sort of a inertia and you just keep going. So I learned to just paint some and then when I'm not feeling inspired, I stop and just put it aside and grab the next painting and work on that a little bit. So this one I was working on and it wasn't, it just wasn't coming together quite. It, it was, I liked it, um, but it wasn't quite there. And what I, I learned now, I bring paintings either home, at that point I had an outside studio, but, and now I just bring them into my living room and I live with them for a few days. And I just kept looking at this painting and I had been to China maybe six or seven months before. And what I did was I, I, when I went back to paint on it, I just took a brush and I did the, that, those white areas right in the front, the little kind of line things that vaguely look like they could be Chinese characters. Yeah, right there and then above that. Yeah, right in there. And I just popped those on top and I felt that really completed the painting. And so it's, I think my compositions are kind of, um, they're just like a struggle, but I, I've i studied the basic composition. You know, I think there's what, nine of them, depending on who you talk to. There's, um, I use cantilever a lot. And um, I like things a little bit, I like to leave things a little bit off balance because I feel like it puts more energy into the painting for the viewer. The, you're always trying to balance it and be, you become engaged mentally with the painting somehow. At least that's my experience. Yeah. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I, I have taught art history and art appreciation. And one of the tenets, especially in the, the art appreciation classes that I taught was that um, that is, that adds dynamism, putting things, you know, so they're not completely symmetrical. Asymmetricalism is more dynamic. Right. So, okay, well, let's look at another one. So this one is really interesting. And I want, you mentioned something to me that I wanted to discuss as well. You had said that you are influenced by reflections as well. Maybe it's a reflection in a puddle. Maybe it's even a reflection off a beautiful, shiny automobile. And I, to me, I see it quite clearly in this. Could you talk about that a little? Right. Um, yeah, the, the reason I kind of hit on that is um, in college, I did both representational art and occasional abstract art and the teacher I had it was just that's what I did I don't know it wasn't a big deal and then as I've gotten around in the world and then I moved over into abstract um, I discovered that particularly in the United States a lot of people just flat out say oh I don't like abstract art or I don't understand abstract art and I ran into that so much. First of all, I question like, wow, where did this come from? And then why didn't I get that attitude? Because pe most of the people telling me this, or a lot of the people telling me this were artists. And, um, and then I would go to residencies in, in like Germany and Australia and other, you know, France. And, and I was particularly struck one residency in Bavaria, we were in a very tiny blue collar town that was 
it's totally supported by a, a factory and that's where everybody lived and everything and there was this artist residency in the middle of it where artists would come from all over the world and sit there and paint and um and then we'd always we always would have a show you know once a month or so and all the townspeople would come in and it was so sweet because they they were so excited they said oh we love abstract paintings there's so many things to look at and so you can find things in them and there's it's so neat and then I get home to the United States and I go back to my um, art classes and we'd line up all our paintings at the end of class and people would say oh I just don't get abstract art I hate abstract art and I was like wow how come did this happen so I started to think about ways that abs to explain abstract art and um and then oh at a, about 20 years ago or so I was walking out to the parking lot and there were a whole lot of cars and as I walked up to my car I realized like oh my goodness there's all these weird reflections you know and they're all pieces of things and you know bits of a tree and the other part of somebody's hood of the car and they make all these weird shapes and and so abstract art is all around us and then just last week I was at the doctors and they had a glass jar on the table and it was I don't know what they were it was full of some kind of bright blue it probably wasn't vinyl gloves but it kind of looked like a bunch of vinyl gloves and they were making all these whatever it was was making maybe it was armbands you know for a blood test and they were making all these funny little triangular abstract shapes and I thought you know we're looking at abstract all the time you know and also what made me wonder about is when I see good abstract paintings I have such an incredible visceral response to really good ones just like I do with really good representational paintings and um so there's something there. And so I'm, I've been trying to connect, like, what is that exactly that um, I'm responding to? So, um, and, and also the other thing is um, maybe appropriate to this theme is, uh, I heard a story once about a man who sold Oriental art to New York City. And one day he had this huge shipment come in from Asia and he was unpacking it and there were boxes every place and and all these mu museum curators came in and they were you know grabbing at the shipment and pulling things out because they were just trying to get stuff before the other person got it and they're grabbing all these pieces and and so the shop owner was you know selling them they'd say how much is this and he'd go whatever you know and so eventually they all left and they were unpacking and his assistant said what kind of a businessman are you um you haven't looked at your inventory sheets you don't know what you paid for these pieces of art how can you possibly run a business like that and the owner said well it's really easy i just look at the piece of art and see how much energy is in it and i know what to charge and so i thought well that's interesting because as an artist, what I need to do is learn how to put energy into my painting. And, um, and I've never heard anybody talk about that until this morning. I was on a Zoom presentation from a museum guy who was talking about masterpieces. And the very first thing he said was, um, you know, you have to look at the energy in the painting to understand what's going on. So I thought, okay, I need to learn how to put the energy in there. And so. <laughs> well, and I know exactly what you mean by energy. Um, I, art to me, to my mind is extremely alive. And when I place things on the wall, for example, when I was placing yours, there were some pieces that dialogued very well, like two old friends, they just had a great conversation on that wall. And there was uh, other pieces that were, weren't so sure about those other two. So I had to, you know, get it over with, with somebody else that it talked to a little bit nicely. <laughs> so it was, it was fun. Yeah, I had one other very cool experience. It was years ago in a workshop and I was painting in watercolor and and watercolors tend to go pretty fast. And I was in what I called my black phase. 
and I was painting mainly black paintings, you know, like 90% black, maybe tiny bits of, little bits of color and stuff. And, and I was playing this game with myself as an artist. I'd paint these big black gestures and then I would paint some more gestures over them. And then I would paint for a bit and get the paint until where I thought it was pretty good. And so then I would look at it for a little bit and say, okay, what can I take out? Because every single teacher I've ever had all the way back to college has always told me you got too much stuff in your painting, you need to take three quarters of it out. So I was playing this game like, okay, what can I take out? So I would take things, I would paint things black and remove, you know, things by painting them black. And then I'd look at it some more and go, oh, okay, I can take this thing out over here and I'd paint that out. And so I was slowly walking my way towards painting things out. And I painted one thing out and the painting went boom. And I went, oh my God, it was just about physical. It was so startling. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I guess you're done. <laughs> you know, and um, it was very, very interesting experience. And That's cool. Let's get yeah. another piece. This one, I mean, it's talk about energy. I love the energy in this. Oh, um, can you explain uh, sort of what you were going for in this one? Oh, um, yeah, again, I'm just trying to get the painting to where actually the previous one, one other thing I should say is that one went on for, oh, goodness, two years. And I could not get that painting to work. It started out like kind of a clay thing with color blocks. And then it morphed into the reflections kind of thing that I had there. But I just kept doing it over and over and over again. And this one was also similarly a struggle. Um, and I've learned over the years that when I really, really struggle with a painting, if I can keep going, eventually it'd be terrific. But I just have to keep going. And sometimes you just kind of lose a lot of hope. So this one was probably over a year in the making. And I kept thinking it's done. And since I've moved here, I've started putting things up on the walls around me so that I see them in all different lights. I see them without my glasses when I get up in the morning. I see them when it gets to be you know, darker and I see them in shadows and stuff. And if it doesn't hold up through all those different kinds of light and I see them near and I see them across the room and and if it doesn't hold up in all those different kinds of light, then I keep working on it. And so this one, I kept working on it and working on it. I kept thinking it's done, it's done. And um, finally, one day, I, I just got enough little marks. I think the upper corner, upper right-hand corner with the that bright green, light green on, on the um, two little squares of um salmon that I think those were kind of the final phase of it but the number of times I photographed it and said okay it's all done and then I'd look at it for a few days and go oh no this annoys me and oh that's that's an important thing about um painting is well number one knowing when it's done that's something that every artist I know struggles with and for me um, I had my teacher when I lived up in Virginia, I had a really good teacher and um, he would also often guide me to the point where I can go, okay, it's done, you know, or he'd say, yeah, I think that one's done. But once I moved down here and my, my teacher had left and I moved down here <clears throat> and I'm on my own and I've had a few teachers and workshops, <clears throat> but a lot of teachers don't want to tell you it's done because they feel like it's your decision, which is very annoying. But a f the fastest way to find out if it's done is talk to a couple of other people who are very, very good or your teacher. Um, but lacking that, I've had to develop my own um, process for it. And if, if something annoys me about the painting a little, something... Um, a spot or something about it. A lot of times it's so minor, I don't even notice it at first, but over time, and unfortunately it usually takes five or six months, but over time I realized, oh yeah, that annoyed me yesterday and that annoyed me last week. And so then I, 
it gets enough into my consciousness, so I'll do something about it. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I was I was just going again for the energy and the softness and the light and the push and the pull and textures and, um, and different colors. I love having a lot of different colors in my paintings, um, but living down here in South Florida, um, as far as the galleries are concerned, they only want a certain range of colors. They want neutrals and, and um, and blues and grays and ocean kind of colors. And I have been experimenting more in that direction because I used to have extremely bright colors all over the canvas. And that brings up the question that some people ask me, like, are you selling out or why would you let outside things determine what you paint? But I see it more as okay, I haven't painted that way, so I guess I'll try it out. And it's like a challenge. And so, so I was trying to work here with more neutral colors, but I couldn't resist throwing in some colors, <laughs> some bright colors, the red, the salmons and the corals and stuff, so. Delightful, let's look at another one. Now this is a, a dark piece and it's, I'm going to say it to everyone listening now, it's, this one is hard to photograph there here yeah. and at the top there it's a beautiful metallic copper so when one walks by this piece there's this glimmering it's it's extraordinarily lovely and i am pleased to say that we are moving forward on acquisition paperwork for this piece cathedral one um, to make it part of our permanent collection. So tell us a little bit about this. I like the story, but I, let's tell our viewers a little bit about this piece. Oh, okay. This, yeah, this was um, I, one of my favorite, <clears throat> excuse me, I have allergies today. One of my favorite residencies that I go to is the Virginia Center for Creative Arts in um, Amherst, Virginia. And I've been going there for oh, I guess about 10 years now. And it's just, the first time I went, I almost cried. I got a scholarship and I just about cried. They give you the biggest studio I've ever had and it's all mine. And I was like, oh my goodness. And then you get a bedroom and then they feed you. And so like, that's all you gotta do is just go paint. And the setting is really, really beautiful. It's very rural and then to top it off, you're living there with about 20 to 25 um, artists, writers, poets, and musicians. And so you have meals with all of them and the cross culture exchange. And then they're, oh, and they can be from all over the world. And some of them might be grad students just getting started. Some of them might have a pretty hefty career. Some of them might be, it might have a pretty big name in whatever their um, uh, media is. And, um, and then there's all of us in between. And so anyway, it's absolutely wonderful. It's a wonderful environment. So this painting, um, I was working on there and it had been a lot of bright colors and I had grown enough in my art to realize that it was a little bit garish. So, so I, and then I had gotten a bunch of metallic paints while they were building my house, all my painting, all my paint materials went into storage and I didn't know I was going to build a house. I thought I was just going to go buy a house here in Florida. And so I let them put everything in storage. And then I got down here and bought the house and it was like, oh, for six months, I won't have any anything. I don't have anything at all. I don't have my brushes or any paints. And I found a great place to go paint for the summer. So I went on eBay and I ordered big lots of paint and um, and all these metallic paints came in, which I would rarely use. But I thought, okay, well, we'll experiment with these. And so I love the copper. The copper is my favorite. And there's also silver metallic in this painting. And I discovered by putting the metallics underneath the other paints, it creates this really neat effect. So anyway, I was playing around and I was going, I also love glazes and textures. And this painting, the reason it's so hard to photograph is, first of all, it's very, very dark. 
and has so many glazes on it. And um, I just kept building up the glazes and building them up with all different dark colors to give them a real incredible richness. I just love it. And I was playing with the copper and then there was a knock on my door at the residency and the art artist next to me said, do you know that Notre Dame is burning? And I was like, oh my God, you know, and, and I, I went through all the, you know, really sad emotions that we all went through and was thinking, oh, you know, I haven't been since college and I've always meant to get back and see it. And, oh, I was just feeling sad. And then I started working on this painting and I said, oh my goodness, this looks just like Notre Dame burning, you know, an abstract. Um, version of it. So I kind of stayed with that. And, um, and I was hesitant about naming it cathedral. Um, because a lot of times if there's something um, sad or negative with your story, um, people don't always receive it well. So um, for a while, I wasn't going to use that uh, title, but um, Patricia kind of encouraged me to go ahead with that. So anyway, I, I just love this painting. Um, and I'm sorry, the photograph, I'm not sure how to photograph it um, better. And there's a second one, there's a pair, it has a pair, but I haven't finished the pair yet. I'm still struggling with it. And um, so someday there'll be a second one. And um, well, it's, it's beautiful. The, the impasto that you built up is just glorious. And as I mentioned, um, all of these pieces that you're seeing are on view at the Appleton Museum of Art in our balcony gallery, which is dedicated to Florida artists. And so you can come see this in person and admire it because it's a beauty. So let's look at another one. This to me, when I think of Kristen Herzog, this is what I think of. This to me is your where you're most happy, that gorgeous saturated blue that you could just, you want to dive right into it. This is what made me fall in love with your art. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was surprised when you said that because it's a smaller painting. It's 30 by 40, which used to be huge for me, but now that I've gotten into the bigger sizes. So I don't think of the smaller ones so much. Um, and as I said before, I, I always work on six or seven at once. And so this was one of the smaller side paintings I had going. And um, and then the way it kind of works is I'll be painting on my major focus um, painting for whatever I'm doing in the studio. And then I'll pick up the side ones and, and um, you know, I'll paint them for a break or just to use up a little bit of paint I've got on my brush to make sure that I don't do something dumb with the bigger painting. And so then eventually I'll pick up the little paintings on the side and go, oh, this is pretty good. I think I'll finish it off. And it's kind of like getting a free painting. And so this, this was one of those, but it, it, I love playing with those dark blue glazes. Um, and I have one that I did a couple years ago of it's irises and stuff. And, and I just really got into making the blue glazes just really glow. And the thing I love about acrylics is you can work very fast. And when I was in the big studio with about 30 other people, um, the people who were painting in oils had to paint something and then they had to wait three days for it to dry, literally three days. And, um, and then they could go, out, go back and paint on it again. And that would drive me nuts. I'm too impatient. <laughs> and so um, with acrylics, I can glaze them. And um, then within usually 15 minutes, I can hit, hit it with another glaze or more paint and stuff. And by combining glazes, lots of different shades of, of blues and then throwing in more purples and stuff, I can get so much depth. And it's really fun to just keep building it up and building it up. And, and you're right that the texture and the glazing and stuff um, is what I really love doing. And when I look at these now, it goes all, that goes all the way back to college. That's exactly how I painted in college. I have one painting from college and, um, and it has those same 
elements in it, the textures, the glazes, and the kind of the light flowing through it. So, yeah, it's just it's extraordinary. I encourage people to come and see it in person. Um, I love this one too, and to me, your titles. It's I, I think I mentioned this to you when last we spoke. I I. When I approach a lot of art, I don't look at the titles. I just want to be one-on-one -on -one with it and understand it and have it talk to me the way it needs to talk to me. But when I see your titles later, then it's like, oh, I get it, title pool. I mean, you can almost like see the little urchins and the fish and the little all the little creatures that are living in there. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, this one reminded me, the beach that we used to go to when I was a kid, um, it had this one area that was this giant, giant rock, maybe about two stories high, and then a bunch of rocks around it. And then it made um, in higher tide a really nice pool, a basically a tidal pool. And as little kids, we loved playing around in there because there'd be there'd be all these critters. It'd be all the starfish and the horseshoe crabs and yeah, all kinds of other things. And um, so that's kind of what it reminded me of. And, and this painting was part of a pair. Um, there's a, it kind of goes right to left. And, and um, I had them in this, my studio down in Naples and a lady came in and it's, it's only happened to me a few times, but it's fun when you have an open studio and some, someone comes in and just falls in love with your painting right there in front of you. It's just so, it's such a neat, um, reinforcement and so anyway she just fell in love with the two of these and um, and then she said they'd come back and then um, it became summer and they didn't come back but then later in the early fall because people here in Naples go home for the summer which isn't such a bad idea and um, and then they come back again so anyway she came back and she called me and she said oh I want to see that painting those paintings again, um, but I don't have much room. And so I took them down to her condo and she had a beautiful, beautiful condo. But unfortunately she was um, from Europe and she had all this big European furniture that goes all the way up the walls, you know, like big wall units. And I don't know else what else you call them, um, China cabinets and everything. And, and she said, the only place I could really get both of them is if I give up my TV. <laughs> and I was, I was so flattered that she would even consider it. <laughs> and, and she said, the only problem is my grandchildren would, would never talk to me again. So, so finally, we found a spot where she could put the one and it was right over her breakfast table, which was really nice. And um, so I always tell people when they buy a painting, I, I say, well, look, you have a week to live with it. And if you decide within a week that you don't want it, I, I will take it back and give all your money back. Cause basically I don't want my painting in a home where they don't love it. And I don't want them to think, oh, I made a mistake on that one. I'd rather have it back, you know, as much as I would like to sell it. I would rather have it loved. So, so anyway, she looked at me, she said, oh, I am not gonna bring that painting back. I love the painting. <laughs> and so she did keep it. And, but, and I felt badly that this one was in some ways orphaned, but I'm so glad it's in the show because it feels like it's got its own life now. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a beauty. So let's look at another one. Now we were talking about this one too, and I I think it's really lovely how you have that sense of truly going into a forest or in in some type of vegetative area where it's lighter outside, and then it gets deeper and darker and more mysterious as you proceed into the forest. I think this is. The, like the perfect title for this. Oh, so, you know, I, 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 I'd never thought about it until just right now, but the house I grew up in, um, we had a nice big yard to play baseball and stuff, but we were surrounded on three sides by woods and they were pretty deep woods. And as kids, we were in there all the time, exploring in the woods and playing in the woods. And so that, that's kind of, I think has influenced this a lot because I love being in the woods. I don't go there enough anymore. 
But um, that's very much a part of my DNA, I think, was being in the woods. And I feel so sorry for kids these days that spend all their time on their phones and their computers because we come home from school and we go play in the woods and, and we'd make huts and there was a pond in there where we'd ice skate and, and um, just all, and there was, in the, if you went really deep, there was a big old Victorian house where an old lady lived and, and now it's become an art center, but back then she lived there. And, and um, so I guess I have that feeling. And then from fairy tales and things that we all grew up with, um, you just have this um, dream quality to, um, that I like getting into in my paintings that I try to, I try to, um get out of real life a little bit with my paintings um especially these days <laughs> but um you know like everyday life is kind of normal and I feel like a painting should be kind of timeless and it should just bring you out of yourself a little bit to think about what could be or what possibilities there are and um so that's I, that's what I like exploring in my paintings yeah, it's it's a lovely one. Um, Thank you. So this one, I want to kind of touch on two things. First, I want to talk about the sizes of your paintings because the majority <laughs> of them are quite large. Now, I know that was probably a progression, but can you can you talk about why you choose to create large canvases? Um, yeah, there, there's several reasons. And again, it's kind of outside influences to some extent. But um, when I started painting after, you know, once, once I started painting seriously about what, 15, 20 years ago, um, I, um, I started out small and I, I went back and took a watercolor class just to get my hand back in. And I'd never been good at watercolor. And so she started us off on very tiny um, pieces, maybe, you know, five inches by 10 inches. And then as I get got farther into watercolor, I I was gradually moving up in size. Eventually I got to, you know, like a half sheet and a, a sheet of water, standard watercolor paper is 22 by 30. And so a half sheet is half of that. And um, so I I gradually moved up to a half sheet. And then I guess I just needed to expand and Oh, and also they, my teacher mentioned one day, she said, yeah, you, if you notice in the shows, all with the shows, most prizes are won by the largest paintings. And I was like, oh, okay, I need to aim for that. So, so there's always an incentive. And I enter, I started entering shows a lot. Um, they can be very discouraging, but <clears throat> it can also be encouraging when you actually get in and, um, or win an award even or something. So anyway, I moved up to a full sheet, but I remember when I went from a half sheet to a full sheet, it was a big struggle. I had to really work into it. So then, then I got my last teacher, um, Rob Vanderzee, and, and he said, well, what media do you do? And I said, oh, I do watercolor. And he said, oh yeah, you know, I do every media except maybe not watercolor so much. Why don't you try acrylics? And I said, oh, I did those in college and I hated them, they were horrible. And um, he said, oh, we'll give them a try. And you know, in 10 minutes I was happy in acrylics and I haven't gone back to watercolor anymore, sadly. But, but anyway, the other thing was that, um, I could store lots of watercolor paper at home. Like I have maybe 400 watercolor paintings. Not all of them are good or done or all of that, but they just take up a small space in the cabinet. And I thought it was cheaper to paint on paper, but then my friend said, no, actually it's cheaper to paint on canvas because with paper paintings, you have to frame them to enter the shows and that gets really expensive, which it had. And, and then you still have the storage problem. So I moved over to canvas with the acrylics and my biggest size in Virginia got to be, my go-to size was 30 by 40. And um, which is what I think the, the previous one is, a 30 by 40 size, which is a good size and it's a good size in a home. And then again, some one day my teacher said, 
you know, if you wanted to get into real shows like museums and stuff, you got to paint bigger. And I was like, oops, okay. So I went up to the biggest size my car would take. I tried them all. The biggest size my Honda would take was 36 by 48. And I could only get four of those in the car at one time. And so uh, I was limited to that. And then the woman next to me had a minivan and she was painting in this kind of size. She, all of her paintings were this size, they were huge. And she was having so much fun and she's a wonderful painter. And she did these great big gestures. And, and I was just watching that and I was like, whoa, that looks like fun. So finally I had, I bought two big canvases but they had to be delivered. And then to get them home, I had to pay someone with a minivan. And then I couldn't enter them in shows because I had no way to transport them. So it became a big liability. So when I moved down here to Florida, um, they told me flat out, the houses are building down here all have high ceilings. And the gallery said they wouldn't even look at anything smaller than 48 by 48, which is what, four feet by four feet. And so I bought a minivan, which has turned out to be wonderful for art. And um, it took me a while to get into the bigger size again. But um, I also, I love it because I love the freedom of it. And, um, and they really make a statement in a room in a normal house, which I like. And the only deflating thing is when I go to a gallery, or I go to a museum after lugging these giant paintings around the house and it scares the cats. You know, I have these big giant five foot paintings and four foot paintings and, and I'm lugging around the house to try them in different light and stuff. And then I get to a museum or a gallery and I look around the room and I go to the smallest painting in the room and it'll be 48 by 48 or five or five foot by five foot. And it's so deflating. <laughs> and so, so I've actually bought a giant piece of canvas. I forget the size of it now. And I was gonna work on it last year and then things happened. But the only way to work on it is of course, without stretching it. And so I have to nail it to the wall somewhere and then paint on it. And for me that's hard because I like to constantly rotate my paintings and I keep rotating them and rotating them and I have them up on the wall and then I have them down to varnish them and I put them back up on the wall and it's up and down and up and down so um so I don't know if that answers the question but uh but but I like I like the freedom of the big size and lately I've been trying a few smaller sizes just to kind of play with that some more because there's value in both. You can get more into the um, details of the smaller ones, but, um, but it's a very different experience and it's kind of hard to go from a big painting back to painting a small one. It's just, it's just a very different experience though. So. Well, and the other thing I wanted to talk about this particular one is this one is a bit of a departure from the other ones. You are utilizing a lot of the canvas on the other ones. In this one, the form is really more in the center of the picture plane. Um, you've got these glorious gestural pieces here and here. They're just fantastic. So were you experimenting with something in, in this one or how, tell me a little bit about it? Um, yeah, I had... I have had some, since I've gotten down here, I've had some very good teachers and workshops and things. And several of them, when one teacher says something, I'll try it, but I don't always stick with it. But several teachers said, you know, you ought to work with shape a little bit more. And when I go back and I look at my, like my enchanted forest ones, they're more amorphous and ethereal and there's, things and lines going on, but actual concrete shapes, not so much. So um, this, this was one, again, this is another one I was working on at, on a VCCA and, um, and it was, it had these huge shapes, about two thirds of it was this dark oxide red paint, which is a very dense, heavy paint. It's a heavy color, but I was having fun playing around with it. It mixes, makes interesting mixes and things. And 
I got the painting pretty far along and was fairly happy with it by the time I left there. Um, but when I got it home and I looked at it and it was, it did have my goal of shapes. And actually one of them was this big flower, kind of an abstract flower. And, um, but when I looked at the painting objectively, I realized it broke down into being basically a red, white, and blue painting. And with all the political stuff and all that, I just didn't want to make that kind of a statement, but also it was just, it had a lot of heaviness to it. And so I went back and worked on it some more, again, working with shapes and trying to get more, keep stick with the shape situation. And, um, and I got it till I felt it was done. I just felt, okay, this one's done. And there's still a little bit of that red oxide, but it doesn't have the heaviness that it had before. And then I brought it home and stuck it up on my wall. And I've got about five good places for hanging the paintings in this room. And um, I stuck it up on my wall and it was there for several months. And living with it constantly, it was right over the TV, so I got to look at it a lot. Living with it constantly, I realized I just loved this painting. Absolutely loved it, even though it was very different from a lot of my other ones, the mysterious forests and things. And I thought, wow, I just love it. So I guess that's what prompted me to enter it in the um, Artist Magazine um, contest. And, um, and it got an honorable mention in a national, you know, a national magazine contest, which was a big surprise. And um, so I guess other people liked it too. Um, but it is, it is a little, it's more gestural, I think, as you said. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm going to go back out of the, back to us talking. So uh, a couple of more questions I wanted to ask you before we open it up. And I wanted to tell all the viewers, um, I think some of you are asking questions already in the chat function, which is terrific. So if you've got something that you want to ask Kristen that has not been touched upon, please feel free to write it in the chat and we'll all read it to her momentarily. But I had just a couple of other things I wanted to ask you. Um, you touched on the, the, the pandemic uh, briefly, but one of the things I do like to ask all the artists, because this has been such a challenging time in so many ways, is when you were sort of cloistered because of the virus, was it a particularly productive time? Did you just sort of close in on yourself and not make art? Because it's really interesting to see it has affected every artist I know differently. Some people went crazy and painted their heads off. Some people just really needed to focus on their heart center and be attentive to their body. So what, what was it for you? Um, I think it was, I would say it was a little bit of both or all three of that. Um, it, I love, <clears throat> I've always loved being alone and I'm very happy being alone, which is good for a painter because you're alone. Um, and I did paint in the group studio for 10 years, but now the last four years I've been painting almost entirely alone. And um, when you're painting alone, you get, I think of it as being down into a painting and you get so far down into it, um, into the process and the manipulating it and the puzzle of it and stuff. And it's almost like a meditation or something. And, um, and so like when you're at workshops and you're trying to get into that and you're surrounded by 20 people or stuff, and then there's always someone that decides to take a break and wander around, even though I'm not taking a break, they decide to wander around and talk to you. And I, I find it so hard to deal with because they're usually people you like and stuff, but they bring you up out of that, um, meditative state which took maybe 10 or 20 minutes to get down into um but I did a lot of painting and I did a lot of ones that they're good I didn't get as much done as I quote think I should have <laughs> but um I did get some very good pieces so I can't really beat myself up too much but I also did a lot of um you know, binge watching TV, the kind of things everybody else did. 
uh, I wasn't too unhappy really um, being alone because it, like I said, it's kind of made for artists. I did find an online painting coach who was really helpful and it was good because you know, I'd make one appointment, but the week or so before I was thinking about my painting and I was much more motivated to get into it. And I probably should have used him more than I did. Um, but, he, you know, one appointment with him would kind of motivate me for probably total two or three weeks, which was really helpful. And I should do more of that. And I, I w started watching a lot of videos online, painting videos to get myself motivated. Um, and then the other thing I discovered was um, YouTubes with art critics, which I never had a chance. To, I don't read that many art critic um, article, you know, columns. And um, but there's a couple very, very busy ones on YouTube. <laughs> and um, and so that was so enlightening and um jerry salts was one of the ones that i discovered and um he um i, I think it's salt is it salts and anyway and one day he was talking about abstract painting and he said um he had a he had talked to someone who said the painting made him happy and i thought well that's a really good um thing to think about and the client said, well, I don't know what it is. I don't understand abstract. And Jerry said, well, how does it make you feel? And the guy says, happy. I really, really makes me feel happy. So the guy ended up buying the painting and putting it in his office and people would walk in and say, what is that? And Jerry would say, how does it make you feel? And they'd say, happy, <laughs> you know? So, so I, anyway, I, I actually found a whole lot of help from listening to art critics. Um, so it made me expand a lot of things. And then I did a lot of, a lot more, um, again, sent, trying to keep centered and keep um, anchored and stuff. Um, and it generally, it was a really positive time for me. So, although I did go into dips of depression, which again, creative people tend to do a lot anyway, but I did do that. Um, but knowing that these mechanical things were out there, like the videos and the critics, made me realize that, okay, I can get myself motivated here. Cool. And then the last question before we open it up to uh, everyone watching, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are part of the College of Central Florida. We're considered a campus. So uh, obviously education is an enormous part of our mission. What would, what advice would you have for either an emerging or a young artist who wants to become a professional artist? What, what words of wisdom could you give them? Oh, oh my goodness. I've got a whole list probably that I could give them. Um, one really important thing I think um, is set up a, an inventory method um, as early as possible because when I was in college I did some I did several really good pieces I probably had maybe 15 or 20 that were decent pieces between prints and paintings and stuff and I sold a couple and things and of course back then photographing your artwork and all that was more complicated but um and I never considered inventorying it I mean I just didn't consider it um but I always knew I'd remember. And then of course, over the years, I was like, occasionally um, I'd see something of mine or my ex-husband called and said, I've got this painting, do you want it? And I was like, what one was that? And I realized, no, I don't remember my art at all. And, and I even found some photos one day in a pile of old papers. And I found this picture of a painting. I'm like, why do I have this? And then I thought about it. It took me like a day to go, oh, maybe that was one of my paintings. <laughs> and so once I started painting again, like 15 years ago, seriously, um, I realized very fast that, you know, I need to make an inventory of stuff. And so I polled my friends and they put me onto a little computer program, which unfortunately the guy has let it die. And now I use Tessera, which is unfortunately so way more complex than I want, but it's affordable and stuff. But there's multiple art inventory programs out there. And every time I finish a piece, I take it out to the 
driveway, you know, a cloudy day, I photograph it and I put it straight into the computer and, and I label it, I put it straight into the computer. Um, I give it a name. I put the size into the computer so I don't have to go hunting all over the place looking for the thing when I'm trying to enter a show. And I am so glad I did that because I think now my inventory is probably pushing a thousand paintings. And again, like I say, a lot of them are junk, but um, I have a record of all of them. And then some paintings that I go back in and work on, um, I have records of previous versions, which may someday be interesting. Um, some people. So, so anyway, um, other things that I would say is, oh, a thing that I learned to think about when I got back in about 15 years ago, I joined the art club, the local art clubs and stuff. And, and then immediately they wanted to make me a president or vice president or, you know, secretary or something with lots of work. And, um, and I realized pretty fast because I are, I still have a part-time job and I also have some health limitations. So I don't have as much time as many people. So I had to think hard about, okay, is this opportunity quote that's presenting himself, is this a, a social opportunity or a, um, uh, an opportunity that will improve my painting or improve my painting progress in some way. And you need both, but, and occasionally we'd talk about it in the studio, but some people are painting because they just, they want the social thing and that's really all they want. They like doing paintings for their family and giving them away and making posters and cards and stuff. Um, and, it's a very nice community and everybody's working hard on something and they're all smart and stuff. And so a lot of times, some people that's really what they want out of painting, which is totally worthwhile. And it's good to be in your community. You wanna be plugged in. So you need some of that. But I wanted, I wanted to be a better painter. And that for me was what I want. And I, I have divested everything that doesn't make me a better painter um, or further my painting education. Um, I, I try to look at it and say, okay, do I need a little bit of social stuff right now or not? And if I don't, then I don't do it. So, and, and then maybe the third thing is, um, the, once I started aggressively going to museums, my painting got noticeably better very fast. And so I started making a point, I was living in the DC area and I could go to museums all the time. Uh, and I make a point whenever I travel, I go to the museum there, any museum, I, art, art museums. Um, and so going to museums aggressively really, really made a big difference. So, so I got more, but that might be enough for a start. <laughs> no, thank you. Words of wisdom, that's always helpful. I'm sure some people, you know, that is gonna be really great information. So let's see, um, anybody has asked anything? Um, mostly people just saying, oh, it's breathtaking. This is exquisite. Oh, thank you. Gorgeous. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay. So if, if anyone has questions, if we didn't go over anything, please feel free to write it in the chat function and we'll ask. Kristen, on your behalf, anything you might want to know about her process or how she makes her beautiful paintings. Okay, and if not, I can keep talking on stuff I've got. Um, let's see. That sounds fun. Let's do that. Okay. Um, Everyone's being shy. Oh, oh another, okay. And another thing that I should have figured out earlier, but um, it's, it's really good advice is, as you start painting to limit the sizes of um, the canvas or paper or whatever you're painting on, um, if you're gonna be framing and things like that, um, because, and also just again, from that thing I was talking about, get, get good at one size, you know, before you move on to the next size, get good at the size that you're working on. And it, 
helps it helps a lot with framing and then if you have a show it helps a lot having a little bit of consistency and working in series it's good to um, do like 10 on the same theme that really helps you develop a lot and a lot of teachers will tell you that um, so that's one of the reasons right now I paint primarily in the 48 by 48 or the 48 by 60 mainly because that's the limitation of my car <laughs> again um, but but also if you're doing a lot of different sizes it can mess with your head as you're getting started although it's good to experiment you know it's it's but it's just good to you have a balance it's good to experiment but it's it's good to limit your sizes because once I started entering shows with watercolors um, I had I only had about four frames because frames were expensive and things would come back from one show I'd take it out of the frame put the new piece in send it off to the next show and stuff like that um, but I kept reusing the frame and then if I sold something it was like oh geez now I got to get another frame you know so um, it's the joys but, the joys of framing we know about that <laughs> and so we we do have a question Chris okay. writes. Have you considered multi-panels to make something larger? Um, yeah, that's like the painting that was a pair, um, the blue one, the tidal pool. That was what I was doing with that. Um, and I've done that a couple of times. Um, the interesting part is that I've, it, it seems to me when I paint things in pairs that always one side is not quite as successful as the other one it's a lot it, it's somehow for some reason for me a whole lot harder than painting just one painting and i i don't well because because you have to make each one work on its own basically and so it's a whole lot harder and i've only had a few that were successful i felt the title pool that both of them were successful um but i have several others that are unfinished <laughs> and, and um but i see other artists do it beautifully all the time so um it's something i need to work on more and um also you're painting the situation that you have available makes a big difference because when i was painting in the big studio with all the a whole lot of people um we were painting on easels and and so you had to get two easels together but then you were running into the other person's face and stuff like that and so um what i discovered the summer that i didn't have a you know i was basically homeless i was renting a, a, a condo and um the art room there had a pegboard up there and the pegboard was there for people to show off their work because they had classes during the winter <laughs> And my friend and I were painting down there for a while and we both looked at the paintbrush one day and went, oh, wow, we wonder if that would hold a canvas. And it did, and it's wonderful because it, it, it doesn't take up the footprint. If you have a small space, which I do now, um, the easel takes up a big footprint in your room. And so I've had pegboard board put up on one wall in my studio. And so I can just kerplop two paintings side by side there. And it's easier to paint pairs, um, but it, uh, it somehow it's, it, I, I have a hard time, like collage is something, all my friends do collage, they do it beautifully. I, I love a lot of paintings that have collage in them and I try it and I kind of, I'm just a complete flop at it. So, um, but I, I, I should say um, it's been an interesting process for me to learn my painting process, because I moved here four years ago, as I mentioned, and um, I suddenly am painting alone, and, and for 10 years or whatever it was, I was painting in the large studio. And so the way my process there worked was I would go down there two, maybe three days a week, and I'd get there at eight, and I'd paint till six or seven, I just paint all day long and um, there are a lot of people around and a lot of wonderful painters there and we were all really close close friends and the feedback and the camaraderie was fabulous and so then that was my process I go down there and paint and we had a teacher and and 
that was how I painted. And then when I, my teacher left and um, I moved down here and I'm painting on my own and I've tried having an outside studio and the first outside studio I had, I'd finish a painting and bring it home and I put it up in the living room and then I'd look at it and realize, oh, it's not done as I thought it was, or the light was different and it didn't look good at night and stuff. And I'd take it back to the studio and I'd work on it somewhere. And then I'd finish it and I'd bring it home. And I'd, oh, this isn't working. And I'd take, and most of them I would take back like five times. And I'm thinking like, there's a message here. And so now I'm painting at <clears throat> my house. The room is very small, which is, difficult so I drag things out to the living room to look at them and then drag them back into the studio but it's easier than dragging 20 miles down to the studio but I realized that <clears throat> what was available to me in painting in my home versus the studio has changed my process of how I paint but now I understand my process and um, so that's been it's been a journey but it's been very helpful very interesting. Very cool. Well, that's about it for the questions. As I said, I guess I guess we just covered it all. Okay. <laughs> <For us. laughs> okay. So I don't know what time we're supposed to wrap up on. Oh, uh, we're it's a little bit fluid. It's not work. It's not hard okay. to write. But I wanted to thank you, and then I did want to mention before we sign off for the evening, um, this is an ongoing series. And it's called the Artist's Outlook. We do one a month and they're going on for a while. So next month on the, um, let me, I'm sorry, get that in front of me. I just went blank on the date. I apologize. It's usually the third Thursday of every month. So it will be on the 20th of May. We are having Matthew Bennett, who is a wonderful painter out of Jacksonville, Florida. And his friend, who was also the model for our wonderful Wonder Woman painting titled Primary Color. It's become a huge favorite here at the Appleton. And we're thrilled to have both artist and model together talking about the process of making that painting. Because it really was a teamwork type piece for them both. So we're excited that it'll be the 20th of May, 7 p.m., and we encourage you. And also we do have a playlist on YouTube. We record these. So any that you have missed, you can go on our playlist on YouTube and see all the other wonderful artists that we've been speaking to during this series. So Chris, I wanted to say thank you so much. It has been delightful as always. And we're really grateful for you. Oh, well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. And I'm happy to share my experience if, if it's helpful for anybody. But I really appreciate it. And the museum has been really wonderful to me. So thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you for those kind words. Everyone, good night. Thank you again. We appreciate your tuning in. We had a wonderful amount of people today. We really are grateful for your support and your participation. Thank you so much and good night. Okay, good night. <laughs>